else to say. I want to welcome in my panel for this hour, associate editor and columnist for Real Clear Politics, A.B. Stoddard, The Washington Post's Ashley Parker, back for more. Also joining us, senior political reporter for Yahoo, John Ward, and Ken Delanian returns as well. Uh, A.B. Stoddard. That was a ringing endorsement from Bob Corker for Marshall Blackburn. <laughs> I know Bob Corker's had the most interesting journey, you know, saying that the, basically the president was sort of a threat to the nation. He's mentally unstable. He's an adult daycare center. Right. Really, really um, just unbelievably adolescent tweets back at him. Uh, then he was going to maybe be drawn back into the fray, want to repair relations with the president. And he, you can just tell. He, he he got his sort of retiring senator fever back. And when he was approached by the Senate Majority Leader to not say anything nice again about Phil Breston, you can just tell it got his back up. Because he wasn't even trying today. He was practically outright giggling. John Ward, there are not very many Republicans right now who are willing to actually say in public the same thing that they're willing to say in private about this president. Which has been true for a, l a long time, yeah. Bob Corker seems to be one of the few, as A.B. points out, who now seems to be at least willing to mostly speak his mind. Yeah, I mean, he's one of the few. I mean, this has been a dynamic since Trump was the nominee or even before that. I mean, the Republicans have been saying things in private that they haven't said in public. And this is the frustration of many people. Uh, you know, at the same time, we're starting to see some resistance to Trump's nomination. So there is some institutional <laughs> resistance on that in, in that sense. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, this, this is sort of the through the looking glass element of Washington in the Trump era. Right. And there were a, a, there was a couple of reports, uh, or at least one report I saw this week that canvassed among many Republican senators and essentially said, are you ready to endorse the president for re-election? And there were a few more hems and, and haws than I expected. And that may have partly to do with uh, the Russia investigation. And so we turn to the newly released Comey memos, which are revealing previously unreported conversations that Comey had in the White House, including some about former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Comey writes that during a late January dinner with the president, Mr. Trump told a story about Flynn failing to tell him for several days that he had received a congratulatory phone call from a foreign leader. It was an admission that apparently frustrated the president. Comey writes, quote, in telling the story, the president pointed his fingers at his head and said, the guy has some serious judgment issues. And in another memo from February 8th, Comey writes about a conversation with Chief of Staff Reince Priebus, who says he asked, quote, do you have a FISA order on Mike Flynn? I paused for a few seconds and then said that I would answer here, but that this illustrated the kind of question that had to be asked and answered through established channels. Meanwhile, the president tweeted about Flynn on Friday, writing, quote, so General Michael Flynn's life can be totally destroyed, while shady James Comey can leak and lie and make lots of money from a third-rate book that never should have been written. Is that really the way life in America is supposed to work? I don't think so. And it all comes, as Politico is reporting, that Flynn is engaging in a comeback tour of sorts, giving speeches and endorsing congressional candidates around the country. Uh, Ashley Parker, is the president, does he still feel as though, clearly he feels that Flynn was tweet, treated unfairly, uh, but does he feel like he still owes Michael Flynn loyalty? Or is this, and I feel like I'm probably going to answer my own question here, is this just all about him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think he genuinely has been frustrated with the way Michael Flynn has been treated. He sort of felt it was unfair all along. That's why you have him saying to James Comey, I hope you can see to let this go. Um, but again, a lot of this, Flynn in many ways is sort of the poster child for the allegations of Russia collusion um, and possibly obstruction in the probe. And so in some ways it feels like defending Flynn and saying he's been unfairly tweeted in this. Flynn is really a proxy for himself. The president feels he has been unfairly t treated. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken Delanian, weigh in on this. I mean, it's, it's a bit remarkable for Michael Flynn to be uh, back on the campaign trail after what he's faced with, with this investigation. Well, I think it speaks to a country where there are different truths. And, and the, the one That's version really of reality is that Mike Flynn it was railroaded by the deep state, right. and, you know, by this horribly unfair investigation. And we saw, saw this before a little bit with Ali North. Remember the Iran Contra figure who was convicted of a felony? Felony conviction was overturned, became a right wing media hero, best selling author. We, Mike Flynn could go down this road. But what I think is so interesting about this moment is that we still don't know 
what Mike Flynn told the Mueller investigation about Donald Trump, what he gave right. to get this very sweet deal. He's facing between zero and six months in prison for lying to the FBI. And there, were, there was a lot of reporting about other things he may have done involving the government of Turkey and lobbying deals, that he, none of which he was charged with. So the thinking at the time was, wow, he must have a lot to give on Donald Trump. It's looking like maybe that's not the case. Or, or certainly least, that Trump is not worried about it exactly, anymore. Exactly. John Ward, let's talk a little bit about what Ken said at the top there, which is this idea that we're a country that, that is living completely separate truths. And I know you've spent a lot of time uh, you know, looking at both political parties, but to focus on Republicans, I mean, it, it, it seems as though you know, for Republicans here in Washington who want to be critical of Trump and who are trying to win primary elections, you know, they want to focus on what they believe to be a set of facts uh, that you know, they may share that set of facts with Democrats, and that the rest of the, the, the Trump Republican Party is increasingly operating in a completely different world. Yeah, and this is a problem that has its roots in, you know, proliferation of media outlets and the Internet. I mean, this is not a, a new problem in, in one sense. In another sense, Trump and, and you know, the people that... He but they didn't have a president in the White House before. That's correct. I mean, Trump has been, has been the one who, through using Twitter... I mean, President Obama, let's back up for a minute. When they came yep. into office, they said, we're going to go around the mainstream media. I mm. mean, Robert Gibbs told me that. Dan Pfeiffer told me that. Trump is doing that mainly through Twitter and basically where Obama would occasionally sort of diss, you know, the mainstream media, diss the Washington Post, diss the New York Times and cable news in kind of a disdainful way. Right. Trump is just, like saying, <laughs> is just saying, you know, let's blow it all up. And w that was part of his appeal from the beginning was that a lot of people, and let's, let's face it, conservatives, some part of them have been frustrated with the mainstream media for a very long time, and, and Trump sort of built on that mounting frustration. Right. Let's talk a little bit about another uh, potential, in this case, enemy of the president, fired Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe, who is fighting back amid mounting pressure from President Trump and congressional Republicans. According to his lawyer, McCabe is planning to sue the Trump administration for defamation, wrongful termination, and possible civil claims other civil claims. His lawyer is also accusing McCabe's opponents, including President Trump, of slander. That comes as the Justice Department's inspector general has recommended a criminal investigation into whether McCabe lied to federal officials about a leak to a reporter. Here's what McCabe's former boss, James Comey, told Rachel Maddow about that earlier this week. There were two people who could authorize disclosures, the director and the deputy director. So Andy had the authority to speak to the media and to authorize communications with the media. Do you think he improperly spoke to the media in that capacity then? I don't know for sure. I know that um, he didn't tell me about it, didn't ask me about it before he did it. I think the, the inspector general's report is right in that respect. And I would have expected that. But I think he had the authority to do that. McCabe's lawyer says McCabe did tell Comey that he was pushing back on stories about the Hillary Clinton investigation. And Axios reports that McCabe and his lawyers are looking for ways to release emails and phone call transcripts between the two men to back up their claim. A.B. Stoddard, who's, who's right here? I mean, this, this IG report was pretty difficult for McCabe. It, it really is. I think what Comey said matters, which is that, you know, McCabe, revealed something to the Wall Street Journal that was really tough on the Clinton campaign is the last thing they wanted to read. Doesn't exactly help the candidate. I mean, it, it would be seen to be helpful to the candidacy then of Donald Trump. Now the Donald Trump administration wants to punish him for that. But the point is that he lied about it. So when they say not full candor and everything, it is that level of an offense that within the FBI when you're a high ranking official, lying is not forgiven. And so I think Comey's had a rough couple weeks. I don't think he's done himself, a, 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 I think he's done himself a great disservice in terms of his own credibility. But I think that if they can prove with emails and texts that he didn't lie somehow um, and he's going to challenge the inspector general, then maybe in the end, you know, he exonerates himself. But if you get caught lying as a high-ranking official at the FBI, I think you're going to pay a price for that. Wouldn't it seem as though the inspector general would already have these emails? Yeah, I was just going to say, it's hard to imagine what emails and texts exist that they didn't have access to. What's so fascinating about this to me is that James Comey and Andrew McCabe are allies and w friends or associates, and Comey has defended McCabe when he was fired unceremoniously a couple of days before he was going to retire. But Comey clearly said there that the inspector general was right, that McCabe lied to him about... McCabe claims that Comey authorized him to talk to this reporter 
reporter about a pending criminal investigation, which is a very rare thing in the FBI, not supposed to happen. It never it happen happens, right? I mean, well, I feel like every time we talk to Pete Williams on that's right. TV, it's he's always says, oh, sorry, nothing, they won't comment, <laughs> criminal investigation. There's an exception if it's in the public interest, but the inspector general found that this was not in the public interest, this was in Andrew McCabe's interest, because he was under fire, because his wife was running as a Democrat in Virginia, and the Wall Street Journal was looking into why is he supervising an investigation into a Democratic presidential candidate. Mm. Yeah. Uh, John Ward, what's your view of, of how, and A.B. Sattard alluded to this, about how Comey has handled himself overall uh, this week? It, it seemed as though in the book initially the excerpts came out, uh, Comey was viewed as the picture that he was trying to paint of him, of somebody who uh, was more loyal to, you know, the country, to uh, honor, to these sort of ideas of decency and, and comparing himself, inevitably, to uh, President Trump. But he ended up on defense over some of the smaller items, the, yeah. you know, focus on the president's right. hands, for right. example. Yeah, the, the stuff about the, tr the president's hands came across as petty. I have to say, I personally found it a little surprising that he, his first interview, I believe, was with Stephanopoulos. I found that uh, surprising because if you're looking to persuade, um, you know, more than half the country, you've got to recognize going back to, you know, the debate during the Republican primary, where a lot of conservatives were angry with the way George handled a uh, question about uh, reproductive rights, um, and that's, you know, not the first time conservatives have had a problem with Stephanopoulos. He, I just wouldn't see Stephanopoulos as the first person to go to mm. uh, on on your tour if you're looking to persuade more than just, you know, Democrats. I would say the same about, um, I was a little surprised with some of the other uh, places he went. But I think it's hard to come across as anything other than sanctimonious when you're holding yourself out as a paragon of virtue. An interesting point. Uh, I want to uh, turn to another one of our colleagues uh, because we watched yet again this weekend as the president assailed a reporter over a story that he didn't like. His target this time, the also Pulitzer Prize winning White House reporter for The New York Times, Maggie Haberman. Haberman co-wrote a story on Friday about what the paper describes as the president's poor treatment of Michael Cohen over the years. Haberman and her colleagues report that there are now concerns among some of the president's advisors that Cohen will cooperate with federal officials. In a series of tweets yesterday, the president called Haberman, quote, a third-rate reporter who doesn't speak to and has nothing to do with. He called some of his former aides even worse. The Times was careful to note that Haberman has interviewed the president three times on the phone and twice in the Oval Office. That is a tweet from her colleague at the Times, Michael Schmidt, uh, who notes that the president, quote, said, who I don't speak to and have nothing to do with. That, of course, the famous Trump thumbs up. And that is our friend Maggie, friend of uh, Ashley Parker. This, this is something that the president does not infrequently. He does, in fact, and there are some reporters that he has talked to for years uh, and built these relationships with and now in public, you know, turns around and trashes them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think any time the president of the United States attacks you, especially by name, as he often does with Maggie Haberman, I think it can be jarring and uncomfortable. Um, but if there's one thing we've learned uh, covering him is that when the president calls something fake news, um, it doesn't mean it's fake. It doesn't actually mean the facts are incorrect at all. What it means in the case of this fantastic story Maggie and the Times did on Michael Cohen is that is that it's true um, and it's hit on some clear truth and it just so happens to have gotten under the president's skin. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if all of his supporters know that, um, but, but when you see these tweets, it means someone has written something true more often than not, and that true thing has driven the president absolutely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that he's trying uh, to push back on. Uh, Ken Delanian, quickly on Michael Cohen and that time story where they essentially said, look, this guy, they haven't, the president's been nice to this guy, and so it means that he's more likely when the feds come knocking and say, hey, we can put you in jail for however many years, or you can talk to us, the Cohen is going to decide to talk to them. I actually think that that will be less of a factor than the idea that he's facing many years in prison. He's got a, a young son. He talked to me about one, taking his son to UCLA. He's a baseball player. The idea that he's not going to be able to see his kids' baseball games for many, many years, that's what's going to get him to flip if, in the end, that's where he stands. Mm. Ken Delanian, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.